Hello there, it's the Lobster Gamer, the star of the not-so-popular web show, the Lobster Peace Theater, and I'm here today to uh, introduce a new series that I will be doing in the near future, where I will be uh, reading audio recordings of the stories of H.P. Lovecraft, a author with whom I am very familiar and very um, enamored. I've not read all of Lovecraft's fiction, and some of the stories I will be reading to you will be things I will be experiencing with you the first time. But uh, as you may know, if you've actually watched my show, I am a huge fan of Lovecraft, and uh, as I've reviewed two different uh, interpretations of the Dunwich Horror, that will be the story I will be beginning with today, uh, starting this reading. Um, we looked at both the 1970 and 2006 versions of the movie in which uh, tells the curious story of the Waitley family and their connections to the occult and various other things. Although this one does not take place at the corner of Boudreau Road and Thibodeau Corner, it's still certain to be a terrifying tale, and the Dunwich Horror is probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite, uh, story by Lovecraft. If you don't know who Lovecraft is, he was one of the pioneers of uh, horror fiction and created the, the Cthulhu mythos, if you've heard of Cthulhu, you know, the big tentacle green thing and stuff, who's a meme on the internet now and whatnot. Um, so we will uh, just begin by reading. Uh, I appreciate you listening to my intro, and I won't do this in every video, but uh, here it is. The Dunwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft, Chapter 1. When a traveler in north-central Massachusetts takes the wrong fork at the junction of Aylesbury Pike, just beyond Dean's Corners, he comes upon a lonely and curious country. The ground gets higher, and the briar-bordered stone walls press closer and closer against the ruts of the dusty, curving road. The trees of the frequent forest belts seem too large, and the wild weeds, brambles, and grasses attain a luxuriance not often found in settled regions. At the same time, the planted fields appear singularly few and barren, while the sparsely scattered houses wear a surprisingly uniform aspect of age, squalor, and dilapidation. Without knowing why, one hesitates to ask directions from the gnarled, solitary figures spied now and then on crumbling doorsteps or on the sloping rock-strewn meadows. Those figures are so silent and furtive that one feels somehow confronted by forbidden things, with which it would be better to have nothing to do. When a rise in the road brings the mountains in view above the steep woods, the feeling of strange uneasiness is increased. The summits are too rounded and symmetrical to give a sense of comfort and naturalness, and sometimes the sky silhouettes the especial clearness of the queer circles of tall stone pillars with which most of them are crowned. Gorges and ravines of problematic depth intercept the way, and the crude wooden bridges always seem of dubious safety. When the road dips again, there are stretches of marshland that one instinctively dislikes, and indeed almost fears at evening when the unseen whippoorwills chatter and the fireflies come out in abnormal profusion to dance to the raucous, creepily instant rhythms of stridently piping bullfrogs. The thin, shining line of the Miskatonic appears upper reaches, has an oddly serpent like suggestion as it winds close to the feet of the domed hills among which it rises. At, as the hills draw nearer, one heeds the wooded side more than the stone crown tops. Those sides loom up so darkly and precipitously that one wishes they would keep their distance, but there is no road by which to escape them. Across a covered bridge, one sees a small village huddled between the stream and the vertical slope of Round Mountain and wonders at the cluster of rotting gambrel roofs, bespeaking an early architectural period than that of the neighboring region. It is not reassuring to see, on a closer glance, that most of the houses are deserted and falling to ruin, and that the broken steepled church now harbors the one slovenly mercantile establishment of the hamlet. One dreads to touch, trust the tedious tunnel of the bridge, yet there is no way to avoid it. Once across, it is hard to prevent the impression of a faint malign odor about the village street as of the massed mold and decay of centuries. It is always a relief to get clear of the place and to follow the narrow road to the base of the hills and across the level country beyond till it rejoins the Aylesbury Pike. Afterwards, one sometimes learns that one has been through Dunwich. Outsiders visit Dunwich as seldom as possible, and 
Since a certain season of horror, all the signboards pointing toward it have been taken down. The scenery, judged by an ordinary aesthetic canon, is more than commonly beautiful, yet there is no influx of artists or summer tourists. Two centuries ago, when talk of witch blood, Satan worship, and strange fort and forest presences was not laughed at, it was the custom to give reason to avoid the locality. In our sensible age, since the Dunwich horror of 1928 was hushed up by those who had the town and the world's welfare at heart, people shun it without knowing exactly why. Perhaps one reason, though, cannot apply to uninformed strangers, is that the natives are now repellently decadent, having gone far along that path of retrogression so common in many New England backwaters. They have come to form a race by themselves, with a well-defined mental and physical stigmata of degeneracy and inbreeding. The average of their intelligence is woefully low, whilst the annals reek of overt viciousness and of half-hidden murders, incests, and deeds of almost unnameable violence and perversity. The old gentry, representing the two or three immediorous families which came from Salem in 1692, have kept somewhat above the level, general level of decay, though many branches are sunk into the sordid populace so deeply that only their names remain as key to the origin of the disgrace. Some of the Waitleys and bishops still send their eldest sons to Harvard and Miskatonic, though these sons seldom return to the moldering gambrel roofs under which they and their ancestors were born. No one... Even those who have the facts concerning the recent horror can say that just what is the matter with Dunwich? Though old legends speak of unhallowed riots and conclaves of the Indians amidst what they called forbidden shapes of shadow out of the great rounded hills and made wild orgiastic prayers that were unanswered by loud cracklings and rumblings from the ground below. In 1747, the Reverend Abijah Hoadley newly came to the Congregational Church at Dunwich Village prepared a memorable sermon on the close, close presence of Satan and his imps, in which he said, It must be allowed that these blasphemies of an infernal train of demons are matters of too common knowledge to be denied, and the cursed voices of Azrael and Berzerel and Basilbub and Belial being heard now and then from underground by above a score of credible witnesses now living, I myself did not more than a fortnight ago catch the very plain of discourse of evil powers in the hill beyond my house, wherein there was a rattling and a rolling, groaning, screeching and hissing, such as no things of this earth could raise up, and which must needs have come from those caves that only the black magic can discover, and only the devil unlock. Mr. Holdley disappeared soon after delivering this sermon, but the text printed in Springfield is still extant, Noises in the hills continue to be reported from year to year, and still form a puzzle to geologists and physiographers. Other traditions tell of foul odors near the hill-crowning circles and stone pillars, and of rushing airy presences to be heard faintly at certain hours from the stair stated points at the bottom of the great ravines, while still others try to explain the devil's hop-yard, a bleak blasted hillside where no tree, shrub, or grass blade will grow. Then, too, the natives are mortally afraid of the numerous whippoorwills which grow vocal on warm nights. It is vowed that the birds are psychopomps lying in wait for the souls of the dying, and that they time their weary cries in unison with the sufferer's struggling breath. If they catch the fleeing soul when it leaves the body, they instantly flutter away, chittering in demonic laughter. But if they fail, they subside gradually into a disappointed silence. These tales, of course, are obsolete and ridiculous because they come down from very old times. Dunwich is indeed ridiculously old, older by far than any of the communities within thirty miles of it. South of the village, one may still spy the cellar walls and chimneys of the ancient bishop house, which was built before 1700, whilst the ruins of the mill in the falls, at the falls, built in 1806 from the most modern piece of architecture to be seen. Industry did not flourish here, and the 19th century factory movement proved short-lived, Oldest of all are the great rings of rough hewn stone columns on the hilltops, but these are generally more attributed to the Indians than to the settlers. Deposits of skulls and bones found within these circles of, around the sizable table like rock on Sentinel Hill sustain the popular belief that such sports were once the burial places of the Pactamucks. Even though many ethnologists, disregarding the absurd improbability of such a terity, a theory, persist in believing the remains Caucasian. Chapter 2 Take a long pull on my lemonade. It was in the township of Dunwich, in a large and partly inhabited farmhouse set against a hillside four miles from the village and a mile 
and a half from any other dwelling, that Wilbur Waitley was born at 5 a.m. on Sunday, the 2nd of February, 1913. This date was recalled because it was Candlemas, which people in Dunwich curiously observe under another name, and because the noises in the hills had sounded, and all the dogs of the countryside had barked persistently throughout the night before. Less worthy of notice was the fact that the mother was one of the decadent Whateleys, a somewhat deformed, unattractive albino woman of thirty-five, living with an angel and a half, or an aged and half-insane father, about whom most, the most frightful tales of wizardry had been whispered in his youth. Lavinia Whateley had no known husband, but according to the custom of the region, made no attempt to disavow the child, concerning the other side of whose ancestry the country folk might and did speculate as wildly as they chose. On the contrary, she seemed strangely proud of the dark, goatish-looking infant who formed such a contrast to her own sickly and pink-eyed albinism, and was heard to mutter many curious prophecies about its unusual powers and tremendous future. Lavinia was one who would be apt to mutter such things, for she was a lone creature given to wandering amidst thunderstorms in the hills and trying to read the great hodorous books which her father had inherited through two centuries of Whateleys, and which were fall fast falling to pieces with age and wormholes. She had never been to school, and was, but was filled with disjointed scraps of ancient lore that Old Whateley had taught her. The remote farmhouse had always been feared because of Old Whateley's reputation for black magic, and the unexplained death of, by violence of Mrs. Whateley, when Lavinia was twelve years old, had not helped to make the place popular. Isolated among strange influences, Lavinia was fond of wild and grandiose daydreams and singular occupations, nor was her leisure much taken up by household cares in a home from which all standards of order and cleanliness had long since disappeared. There was a hideous screaming which echoed even above the hill noises and the dogs barking in the night Wilbur was born, and no known doctor or midwife presided at his coming. Neighbors knew nothing of him till a week afterward when old Whateley drove his sleigh through the snow into Dunwich Village and discoursed incoherently to the group of loungers at Osborne's general store. There seemed to be a change in the old man, an added element of furtiveness in the cluttered brain which suddenly transformed him from an object to a subject of fear, though he was not one to be perturbed by any common family event. Amidst it all, he showed some trace of the pride later noticed in his daughter, and what he said of the child's paternity was remembered by many of his hearers years afterwards. I don't care what folks think. If Lavinia's boy looked like his pa, he wouldn't have looked like nothing you expect. You needn't think the only folks in the, in the folks is the folks hereabouts. Lavinia's read some of his seed, some things the most of you only tell about. I calculate her man is as good a husband as he can find this side of Aylesbury, and if you knowed as much about the hills as I do, you wouldst ask no better church wedding nor hearing. Let me tell you something. Some day you folks will hear a child of Lavinia's calling his father's name on top of Santa Hill. The only person who saw Wilbur during the first month of his life was old Zechariah Whateley of the undecayed Whateleys, and Earl Sawyer's common-law wife, Mamie Bishop. Mamie's visit was frankly one of curiosity, and her subsequent, subsequent tales did justice to her observations. But Zechariah came to lead a pair of Alderney cows, which Holt Waitley had bought of his son Curtis. This marked the beginning of a course of cattle buying on the part of the small, Wil small Wilbur's family, which ended only in 1928 when the Dunwich Horror came and went. Yet at no time did the ramshackle Waitley barn seem overcrowded with livestock. There came a period when people were curious enough to seal up Steal up and count the herd that grazed precariously on the steep hillside above the old farmhouse, and they could never find more than ten or twelve anemic, bloodless-looking specimens. Evidently some bright of distemper, blood of distemper, perhaps sprung from the unwholesome pasturage of the diseased fungi and timbers of the filthy barn, caused a heavy mortality amongst the weakly animals. Odd wounds or sores, having something of the aspect of incision, seemed to inflict the cattle visibly. And once or twice during the earlier months, certain callers fancied they could discern similar sores about the throats of the gray, unshaven old man and his slatternly, crinkle haired albino daughter. In the spring after Whibble's birth, Lavinia resumed her customary rambles in the hills, bearing in her misproportioned arms and the swarthy child. Public interest in the Whateleys subsided after most of the country folk had seen the baby, but no one bothered to comment on the swift development which, which the newcomer seemed to, each day to exhibit. Wibble's growth was indeed phenomenal, for within three months of his birth he had attained the size and muscular power not usually found in infants under a full year of age. His motions, and even his vocal sounds, showed a restraint and deliberateness highly peculiar in an infant, 
and no one was really unprepared when at seven months he began to walk unassisted with falterings with which another month was sufficient to remove. It was somewhat after this time, on Halloween, that a great blaze was seen at midnight on top of Sentinel Hill when the old table-like stone stands amidst its tumultuous of ancient bones. Considerable talk was started when Silas Bishop, of the undecayed bishops, mentioned having seen the boy running sturdily up the hill ahead of his mother about an hour before the blaze was remarked. Silas was rounding up a stray heifer, and he nearly forgot his mission when he flittingly spied the two figures in the dim light of his lantern. They darted almost noiselessly through the underbrush, of the astounded, astonished watchers seemed to think they were entirely unclothed. Afterwards he could not be sure about the boy, which may have had some kind of fringe belt or a pair of dark trunks or trousers on. Wibber was never subsequently seen alive, and the conscious without complete and tightly buttoned attire, the disarrangement or threatened disarrangement of which always seemed to fill him with anger and alarm. His contrast was his squalid mother and grandfather in respect was thought very notable until the horror of 1928 suggested the most valid of reasons. The next January, gossips were mildly in interested in the fact that Lavinia's black brat had commenced to talk at the age of only eleven months. His speech was somewhat remarkable, both because of its difference from the ordinary accents of the re region and because it displayed a freedom from inf infantile lisping of which children of three and four might well be proud. The boy was not talkative yet, but when he spoke he seemed to reflect some elusive element wholly unpossessed by Dunwich and Stenizens. The strangers did not reside in what he said, or even the simple idioms he used, but seemed vaguely linked with his imitation, or which the internal organs that produced the spoken sounds. His facial aspect, too, was remarkable for its maturity, for though he shared his mother's and grandfather's chinlessness, his firm, pre precociously shaped nose, united with the expression of his large, dark, almost Latin eyes, to give him an air of quasi-adulthood and well-nigh preternatural intelligence. He was, however, exceedingly ugly despite his appearance of brilliancy, there being something almost goatish or animalistic about his thick lips, large, poured, yellowish skin, coarse, crinkly hair, and other elongated ears. He was soon disliked even more decidedly than his mother and grandsire, and all conjectures about him were spiced with references to the bygone magics of old Whateley and how the hills once shook when he shrieked the dreadful name of Yog-Sothoth in the midst of a circle of stones with a great book open in his arms before him. Dogs abhorred the boy, and he was always obligated to take various defensive measures against their barking menace. Chapter 3 Meanwhile, old Whateley continued to buy cattle without measurably increasing the size of his herd. He also cut timber and began to repair the unused parts of the house. A spacious peak grew to fair, whose rear end was buried entirely in the rocky hillside, and whose three least ruined ground floor rooms had always been sufficient for himself and his daughter. There must have been prodigious reserves of strength in the old man to enable him to accomplish so much hard labor, and though he still babbled dementedly at times, his carpentry seemed to show the effects of sound calculation. It had already begun as soon as Wilbur was born, which one of the many tool sheds had been put suddenly in order, clabbered, and fitted with a stout fresh lock. Now in restoring the abandoned upper story of the house, he was no less thorough a craftsman. His mania showed itself only through his tight boarding up of all the windows in the reclaimed section, though many declared that it was a crazy thing to bother with the reclamation at all. Less inexplicable was his fitting up of another downstairs room for his new grandson, a room which several colors saw, though no one was ever admitted to, the closely boarded upper story. This chamber he lined with tall, firm shelving, along which he began to gradually arrange in, arrange in apparently careful order all rotting ancient books and parts of books which during his own day had been heaped promiscuously in odd corners of the various rooms. I made some use of them, he would say as he tried to mend a torn black letter page, which with paste prepared in a rusty kitchen stove. But the boy is fitting to make better use of them. He ought to have them so well as he can, for they're going to be all his learning. When Wilbur was a year and seven months old, in September of 1914, his size and accomplishments were almost alarming. He had grown as large a child of four, and with a fluent and incredibly intelligent talker. He ran freely about the fields and hills, and accompanied his mother on all her wanderings. At home, he would pore diligently over the queer pictures and charts of his grandfather's books, while old Whateley would instruct and catechize him through long, hushed afternoons. By this time, a restoration of the house was finished, and those who watched it wondered why only the upper windows had been made into a solid plank door. 
It was a window on the rear of the east gable end and close against the hill that no one could imagine why a clean wooden runway was built up to it from the ground. About the period of this work's completion, people noticed the old tool house, tightly locked and windowlessly clabbered since Wilbur's birth, had been abandoned again. The door swung listlessly open, and when Earl Sawyer once stepped within the after-cattle-selling column old Waitley, he was quite discomposed by the singular odor he encountered. Such a stench he averted as he had never before smelt in all his life except near the Indian circles up on the hills, at which he could not come from anything sane or of this earth. But then the homes and the sheds of the Dunwich folk had never been remarkable for olfactory immaculateness. The following months were void of visible events, save that not everyone swore to slow but steady increase in the mysterious hill noises. On May Eve of 1915 there were tremors, which even the Aylesbury people felt whilst the following Halloween produced an underground rumbling queerly synchronized with the burst of flame. Then which Waitley's doing it from the, su from the summit of Sentinel Hill. Wilbur was growing up uncannily, so that he looked less like a boy of ten as he entered his, looked like a boy of ten as he entered his fourth year. He read avidly by himself now and talked much less than formerly. A settled taciturnity was absor absorbing him, and now now and then, but he t uh, and for the first time people began to speak specifically of the dawning look of evil in his goatish face. He would sometimes mutter an unfamiliar jargon, and chant in bizarre rhythms would chill the listener with a sense of unexplainable terror. The aversion displayed by him by the dogs had now become a matter of wide remark, and he obliged to carry a pistol in order to traverse the countryside safely. His occasional use of the weapon did not enhance his popularity amongst the owners of canine guardians. Few callers at the house would often find Lavinia alone on the ground floor, while odd cries and footsteps resounded in the boarded-up second story. She would never tell what her father and the boy were doing up there, though once she turned pale and displayed an abnormal degree of fear when a jo jocose fish peddler tried the locked door leading to the stairway. That peddler told the store loungers at Dunwich Village that he thought he heard a horse stampeding on that floor above. The loungers reflected, thinking of the door and the runway and the old cattle that so swiftly disappeared. Then they shuddered as they recalled tales of old Whateley's youth and of the strange things that are called of the earth when a bullock is sacrificed at the proper time to certain heathen gods. It had for some time been noticed that the dogs had begun to hate and fear the whole Whateley place as violently as they hated and feared young Wilbur personally. In 1917 the war came, and Squire Sawyer Whateley, a chairman of the local draft board, had hard work finding a quota of young Dunwich men fit even to be sent to the development camp. The government, alarmed at such signs of wholesale regional decadence, sent several officers and medical experts to investigate, conducting a survey which New England newspapers readers may still recall. It was the publicly attending this investigation which set reporters on track of the Waitleys and caused the Boston Globe and Arkham Advertiser to print flamboyant Sunday stories of young Wilbur's precautiousness, Old Waitley's Black Magic and the Shelves of Strange Books, the sealed story of the ancient farmhouse, and the weirdness of the whole region and its hill noises. Wilbur was four and a half then and looked like a lad of fifteen. His lips and cheeks were fuzzy with a coarse dark, dark down and his voice had begun to break. Earl Sawyer went out to the Waitley's place with both sets of reporters and cameramen and called their attention to the queer stench which now seemed to trickle down from the sealed upper spaces. It was, he said, exactly like the smell he had found in the tool shed abandoned when the house had finally repaired and like a faint odors which he had sometimes thought he caught near the stone circle on the mountains. Dunwich folk read the stories when they appeared and grinned at the obvious mistakes. They wondered, too, why the writers made so much of the fact that Old Whateley always paid for his cattle in gold pieces of extremely ancient date. The Whateleys had received their visitors with ill-concealed distaste, but they did not dare court further public publicity by a violent resistance or refusal to talk. And I'm going to leave it off there for now. There's still more than half the story remaining, but I only want to do these in short bits and pieces so that we don't overwhelm you, the listener, with so much uh, horror at once. But now you already see the differences, I hope, between this and the stories presented in the movies in which uh, Wilbur Waitley is played by the the roguishly handsome Dean Stockwell and not at, or, uh, or the um, talented Jeffrey Combs and not at all is a monster as described in the books. I mean, Jeffrey Combs does do a better job of being Wilbur. Any case, if you want to learn more about those movies, check out my reviews. And until next time, we will see you on this new series.